Welcome back to Sustainability Live Singapore. Time for our next keynote of the morning. That's getting to results on net zero. My guest is Chris Catamol, ESG Advisory and Solutions Lead at UL. Hi, Chris. How are you? Hi. Great. Good to be here. How are you doing? Yes, really good. Thank you. We've had a very profound start to things this morning and we are moving on with our second keynote. So the virtual floor is yours. I'll leave you to do your presentation. Then I'll be back for any questions from the audience or from me at the end. Thank you very much. So let's get kicked off. So I've only got 20 minutes, but what I'd like to cover is a little bit on your solutions. For those of you who don't know us, talk about our sustainability commitments, and then to really flip it around and talk about how we use our mission and our commitments to provide offerings to our customers around the world. And then, and then given the topic of this you know, discussion is around getting to net zero, I want to talk about three trends that we see specifically in APAP uh, for companies based here, how you out there can, can harness them for your business on your journey to, to net zero. So briefly about me, so I'm Chris Catamol, I'm based here in Singapore, and I am UL's ESG advisory and solutions lead. Uh, and what that means is really understanding what are the evolving demands of our customers, what's happening in terms of uh, the, 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 the policy and regulation, which is, is coming down the track in different markets, and what are the, the new solutions that we want to develop uh, as you well to support our customers uh, on their journey across advisory, software, inspection, testing, and certification. So briefly, before I go into what we do at you well, I want to talk about our mission, which is to, to work for a safer world. And we've been doing this much as the, the, the 130th year of, of UL being in existence, which is really extraordinary when you think that the average company on the S&P lasts, lasts for 21 years. We really have been doing this a very long time. And over that, that period, the, the definition of, of safety has evolved. And this now informs our ambition, which you see below, which is to serve as our customers' trusted science-based safety, security, and sustainability partner. I think what's, what, what really differentiates us is a focus on science and a focus on operationalizing net zero. I'll talk more about that a bit later. So again, I talked about some of our services, but at our core, we are a certification, testing, and verification business. So we help our customers ensure that the, the safety of of TVs and, and laptops, all kinds of, of different areas. But over the years, we have um, evolved what we offer. And so, for example, now we are we, we provide UL 360, which is one of the leading uh, softwares for collecting, managing, and reporting on ESG data with a leading scope three capability. We have also one of the largest uh, renewables advisory uh, businesses globally, helping you to literally to, to, to build a, uh, a solar plant or an offshore uh, facility for, for wind. So really really a diverse business with a whole range of services designed to support our clients on their net zero journey. But often, you know, with, with these things, with these core presentations, it's hard to really understand what, what a company is doing in, um, in real life, so to say. So a couple of examples here. So on the left-hand side, you see uh, our fire safety testing lab in Chicago. So here is the is the best chance to, to use a, a flamethrower that I'm, 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 I'm going to have in my life. I haven't been there yet, but it's it's really a, an aim of mine. And here we are assessing building components for how they respond in a, a fire situation. On the right-hand side, you see a couple of our field engineers who are inspecting a turbine in Japan. So here we are ensuring the, the safety and the performance of these turbines as we drive the energy transition. So there's a couple of examples to, to bring it to life. So I want to talk about how we think about sustainability at well, given our mission is, is working for a safer world. So we have uh, three areas that we focus on. 
So I won't go into all the detail. That there is more detail on our, our website around our KPIs. But the, the three areas are people uh, on planet and prosperity. So people on planet are really about how we as a company are impacting our employees, our partners, and then the impact of our planet is water, waste, energy, etc. And on prosperity is where we're taking uh, a double a double materiality approach towards towards our, our sustainability strategy, and thinking through how we can elevate uh, the safety, security, and sustainability in everyone's lives. So, what are, what are our, how are our solutions improving uh, sustainability performance across a whole range of, of different areas uh, that I talked about before? And in terms of Reporting, we have set a and a net zero target uh, with the with the BSBTI organization, and we do reporting according to the Global Reporting Initiative. So I encourage you to have a look at our website for, for more details there. But now I wanted to to flip and talk a little bit more about how we apply that expertise with our customers, because we obviously have our own uh, sustainability program internally at UL, but we also offer a range of services to help customers achieve their net zero uh, ambitions. So on this slide, you see our net zero framework. So this is what we use in advisory to support customers uh, on that journey. So at the beginning, we're really helping them to think about what is a a decarbonization vision. And we have a series of experts around the world who have deep experience in different industries, developing the, the roadmaps for change um, and understanding you know, what, what is the honor the possible in decarbonization. The next is, is measuring and, and baselining to quantify the opportunity. So again, here I mentioned UL360 is our leading software many companies use to uh, understand their carbon footprint and opportunities to, to reduce it. Then we have a range of services around um, how do you manage and drive performance. And then as you get into reporting, again, advisory and software solutions um, to, to enable that. And finally, assurance services to make sure that the quality of the data that you're reporting um, is, is up to standard for, for global stakeholders. But I think you know, this um, framework is, is not unique. I'm sure you, you've seen similar from, from Big Four and other types of consultancies. What is really unique about UL is how we operate across um, the, the business of a customer. So we can help a customer set a, 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 a net zero target at the enterprise level. We can understand at a business unit level what are the opportunities for uh, reducing emissions. We can, you know, in supply chain, in finance, and in human resources, etc. Then we often work at the level of a factory. So you see across the bottom some of the services we offer at the factory to do a energy audit, so that we understand at an operational level um, how we can improve emissions. And then we go even further. So we're looking at a product. We're looking at a bill of materials to understand. How can I reduce the carbon footprint of a product? We have services there too. So what, what I think this, this, this says is that we really differentiate um, our services by going from, from really the, the lowest level, you know, the, 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 the tier one, tier two supplier, uh, and understanding bill of materials, carbon impacts, all the way through to the enterprise net zero target. So now again, I want, I want to switch focus and talk about Asia Pacific and the trends here. And so what you have here is the, the number of Asian companies so on the left hand side, number of Asian companies who are headquartered in a APAC who set a, a, a target with the, the science based targets initiative. So you got at 1400 there. And then the right hand side, the number of Asian headquartered companies with revenue over 100 million. Again, you know that, that there are many companies that have set uh, net zero targets. Um, I think we we, we use the, the the initiative as a good benchmark given the the degree of rigor that they are placing and the 
the, the deep cuts that are required at industry levels for companies to, to have a, a target agreed with them. So we think it's a, a reasonable uh, level of benchmark to assess whether a company is serious around their, their, their net zero goal. But clearly there's a big gap here, right? So um, there's lots of work to do and the headline is, you know, the, the time is now uh, in order for us to, to achieve net zero and APAC. So the aim of this slide really was to set up that there is a, a great deal more to do um, if, we are, if we are to achieve net zero. So now I, I want to spend the, the most time here really talking about three trends for the future and how uh, companies in Asia Pacific can really harness them in order to, to do our perform um, and achieve their net zero goals. So firstly, and I, I hope many of you will be happy and, and something that we are seeing with our clients, both um, in Europe, in APAC and in the US is over the, the last five years, um, the number and variability of reporting requirements has, has reduced in general. So now we are beginning to align on fewer um, fewer reporting standards and frameworks as some of the examples you see on the, the left-hand side. And also, many companies have now got into a, a rhythm of, of annual reporting around sustainability. Um, so it's becoming a business-as-usual um, activity. And, and what, 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 what this means is that companies have a greater um, understanding on a year-to-year -year basis of how they're performing against the uh, ESG metrics that are, are relevant and material for their business. And we're starting to see, uh, especially in Asia, uh, a greater, greater movement towards integrating the KPIs into strategy, into purpose, um, so that we, um, we, can really, we can really move from purely reporting our impact to really making a change. So I think, in general, uh, companies in APAC and if they, if they want to to make this change, need to start to do that. So you, you have the the frameworks and standards all kind of figured out. So, the, so the now is that the time to integrate them into strategy, into operations, and into KPIs uh, across the business. So the second trend, which uh, obviously increases the reporting burden, but in different ways for different kinds of companies are uh, increasing overseas requirements for APAC businesses. So, and then you see some of the acronyms there, you know, CSRD and CBAM, CS, uh, DDD, et cetera. So I would split these uh, trend in, 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 two, in, in two ways, or for two groups. So firstly, um, we have those large Asian companies headquartered here who are multinationals that have significant overseas um, operations in Europe and other parts of the world. And for these companies, they are going to need to do reporting um, you know, against the, the CSRD uh, requirements. And for, for many companies who, who haven't um, historically uh, been, 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 been subject to this level of wide and deep reporting, this is going to be, going to be a challenge. And often the, the data requirements for these um, these reporting standards are enterprise-wide across all functions uh, and really require a great deal of centralization in order to, to be effective. So for those larger companies, what we're seeing is the, the need to first centralize data with you know, effective solutions, um, but also to, uh, to, to, to upscale and, and train employees within those specific functions on the implications of these regulations in their business. So in supply chain, for example, on scope three, how are companies going to collect, manage, report on that data? I think some of the other um, so the other group that I, I want to talk about really is the um, the smaller uh, SMEs within or suppliers within APAC who don't have uh, a large footprint uh, outside of the region. So increasingly, because of regulations like CBAM, they are going to need to, to collect um, more data on, on their exports, so on their the carbon footprint, the um, the sourcing, uh, and similar similar metrics, if they are to remain in business with buyers in Europe. So, what this means again is the requirement for for upskilling 
um, the the need to collect um, a, a low level of data on on the, the, the products which they are exporting, um, and to, to to engage with their the buyers in Europe to understand how they can do that uh, do that um, ahead of regulation coming into place. Um, and then also for for some industries, um, the, the requirements for uh, sourcing uh, sustainability will increase requirements for data collection and. We, we see an increasing requirement for increasing um, implementation of solutions um, which can support uh, uh, sustainable sourcing for these Asian, Asian manufacturers. So the headline for the overseas requirement is, you know, more centralization, more training, and integ integrating functional data across uh, enterprise in order to, to meet these requirements. And the last impact or trend that I, I wanted to talk to is perhaps the, the most interesting. And, and, and these are not going to be a mandatory requirement largely for, for a few years. Um, but what we do see is the impact beyond carbon for net zero. So the idea of a just transition where we are able to, uh, to achieve net zero, but at the same time uh, reduce inequality within countries, across markets, um, and, and assess that some of the imbalances in, in trade that, uh, that we see. And also the other aspects of, of, of nature, right? So you, you see many of the, the scandals with the, the, the offset market in carbon. So how do we ensure that the, the quality of, of nature and, and ecosystem services aren't compromised as we, as we focus only on carbon, but we uh, we ensure that with the rainforest and other other sinks are are, are maintained at the current quality, and and, and other other impacts on, on water also will begin to come into play. So there are many scientific aspects of this and social aspects of this, which mean it's a it's a it's a tough problem to to solve. And many uh, standards and frameworks for impact measurement and reporting are being developed uh, at the moment. So really, um, especially for companies in APAC, which are, are in these environments, it's a, good ch it's a good chance to build partnerships across industries, uh, which will enable um, companies to kind of get to, 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 to get ahead of the curve in terms of uh, reporting requirements um, and for them to, to collaborate. Because many of these issues are, are not yet uh, and not get the driver differentiation for, for suppliers, but they are going to become that in future. So the more uh, companies can do to upskill themselves, uh, the, the better position they are they're going to be in. And of course, um, as we increase the different dimensions of biodiversity and water, etc., the the requirements for for data uh, are going to increase. So we're going to see more demands for technology. And again, having an enterprise level view of your uh, ESG impacts. Uh, including deep into supply chain is going to be a, a critical component uh, of success. So that's everything I, I wanted to cover today in terms of um, you know UL solutions, our sustainability program, how we think about decarbonisation for our clients, and some of the, the trends that, that, that we are seeing in APAC as we look forward. I'm uh, really happy to, to answer any, any questions you have, and um, thank you. Very much indeed. Um, a couple of questions I did want to go through. There was one particular word that, that jumped out at me there that I want to go into, is that is people finding a, a rhythm about reporting, which I think is, is fascinating. That is the kind of stage we are at. But I guess the question I want to go into is how do you find that rhythm? How do you reach that point where the reporting, the gathering of information, the working with partners, how do you actually get into that place of it being a rhythm, about it being the new normal? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think, you know, sustainability reporting for a long, a long period, it's been an, an annual exercise, right? So there's a mass scramble towards the end of the financial year to compile uh, the data necessarily, necessary for an ESG report. Um, but increasingly, what we see in leading companies is that they are aligning the data collection and reporting in the same way as if they're reporting on income, their balance sheets. So that, that means 
moving to um, a monthly or a quarterly cycle of data collection reporting, and also integrating the, the, the integrating information together. So you report on your your revenue at the same time you report on your carbon emissions. Uh, in this way, you kind of in, increase the the, the the process excellence around collection because companies have been collecting and reporting on financial information for 100 years plus. So the, the, thing, the, the, the frequency of reporting and the integration with um, the other financial data, these are the key drivers that, that, that we see as helping to uh, produce a, uh, a cadence, which, which, which means it's, it's easy. No, that's an easy point. Yeah, m moving it away from that sort of traditional financial model of reporting. Yeah, why should you? Why not do it monthly, quarterly, or, or so forth? The, the other question I'd have is um, the key challenges that is stopping people reaching that point. Everyone would love to be in that position, but for you, what are the things that stop people reaching that rhythm? Yeah, I think. Um for so reporting, many people see as a, a compliance requirement, and it is a requir compliance requirement. So, what's happening in Asia, in Singapore, in Australia, in Japan, you know, in, in China, that they they announced the ESG reporting requirements uh, recently. It's understanding when when one of these going to come in, and when you have to start reporting, and, and the, the penalties for not reporting, and then building. Uh, a roadmap from from from, from that point and, and, until uh, where, 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 where we are now, because the reality is you, you can't start reporting overnight. It really takes a lot of time to to train, to build a process, to you know implement technology uh, for that to be to be effective. You know, one of the things that that we see often um, with companies in Asia when when they first use our our systems is you know, in the first year they have a, a carbon footprint of, of X. And then in the second year, it increases, increases a lot, and, and everyone is surprised why. What, 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 what's been the driver of the increase in, in the emissions? Actually, it's not because um, real emissions have increased. It's because the company has improved the effectiveness with which it can collect data and report on it. So it really is a process which, which happens over a few years. Oh, that's a fascinating point about that increase, but I guess it's better to know it's there. Okay, Chris, thank you so much. That's a really fascinating point to end the presentation on. Thank you so much for your time and joining us here at Sustainability Live Singapore. Is everyone else? Bye. Thanks, Chris.